All right, so I've got a crying little one up here because you guys see food allergy probably as much as I do. And so we're going to try through the talk today just to give you a construct of how to evaluate, treat, understand lab tests. And then I'll talk a little bit about things specifically for me um, in my clinic. But food allergy is a big deal. That's why this one's crying, right? It impacts them and it puts a significant burden on families. Um, sometimes, you know, people may not really think it's such a huge deal, but really if you rotate or you ever deal with this in families and you talk with them, you can see how much stress and just how much um, of a lifestyle impact this can have. Uh, we went through the disclosure slide already. So I'll talk about some objectives for the slide, understanding definitions and emerging mechanisms of the development of food allergy, prevalence of food allergy symptoms in relation to objective evidence, distinguish between IgE-mediated food allergy and non-IgE-mediated food intolerances. And for those who spend any time with me, you know that we kind of talk about that through the entirety of uh, any rotation, recognizing the potential pitfalls of allergy testing, and then recognizing therapies for food allergy, as well as review the natural history of food allergy. I'll just go ahead and make a disclaimer now. You're going to see statistical numbers all over the place, and I'll try to address that later. And then understand education, indications for injectable epinephrine. So fun things that we hear all the time. You may or may not have heard them. My favorite was a lady that told me, Doc, if I, I'm okay if I eat three shrimp, but if I have, uh, I have to go to the emergency room if I eat four. Um, Another one who told me she's allergic to Atlantic shrimp, but not Gulf shrimp. And I said, I, that sounds like a good choice, but I'm not sure how that's possible. Um, my personal favorite is an allergist. I have my EpiPen. It's always in my glove box. And then, you know, a few other things that we hear that we'll try to touch on. So to kind of get us thinking about how I think about food allergy, and we'll start with this little clinical vignette. So there's a 13-month male who develops vomiting and irritability with his very first ingestion of peanut butter. He has a history of atopic dermatitis and was exclusively breastfed till just a month or so ago. Mom didn't avoid any foods while she was pregnant or while she was breastfeeding. So I see this often in my clinic, like basically on a daily basis. And so I want you guys to be thinking, is this history consistent with an allergic reaction? And can you sitting out there in the audience diagnose food allergy as a general pediatrician? Well, clearly, I want to help you to be able to do that. And y'all are going to be on the front lines of trying to sort this out more so than me. So what is food allergy? You have to start with a definition so you understand how I look at it, right? So food allergy is an adverse health effect arising from a specific immune response that occurs reproducibly on exposure to a given food. That doesn't mean that it's something that happened that there wasn't an identifiable trigger. Typically, there's going to be something in the history that says they ate this and they had that, okay? We take that clinical history and we match that with either skin testing or blood or serologic allergy testing to that allergen, which we determined on the history, right? So this child was fed peanut butter, had a reaction, we look and see if that skin test or a blood test is positive, and that helps us define IgE-mediated food allergy. And that's a big thing that I want to talk with everyone in the audience about today, is when you send it to an allergist for food allergy, we're looking for type 1 IgE hypersensitivity reactions, if you go back to that old Gell and Coombs classification. There are other things that can cause immunologic reactivity, other diseases that can cause immunopathologic reactions, but they may not be IgE mediated. Think about celiac disease, and I'll show some other examples. But when we talk about allergy, we're talking about that IgE mediated type one allergic response, because we can skin test to that, okay? And we can do blood tests to that. And then what to make it really even more confusing, globally, and even more in the U.S., but globally now, people are sort of using allergies synonymously with any sort of immunopathologic reaction to foods. So that gets a little confusing when I'm trying to talk to audience and define what it is we're looking at, but keep those in mind. Definitions, sensitization, and I want you to think about this because sensitization means that you can have a positive blood allergy test or a positive skin test, but it doesn't necessarily diagnose allergy. If I were to just randomly skin test all of you in the audience, 
I might find positive tests to multiple foods that you eat on a regular basis. So that's one of the pitfalls that we want to talk about, okay? Tolerance is that scenario. You have a positive test, but you eat the food without any sort of reaction, okay? In some patients, if they had early onset egg allergy, they may outgrow and develop tolerance, or maybe we desensitize, although I'll tell you this is an area um, of significant debate within my community. Does oral immunotherapy or other treatments really induce tolerance? Or is there just a desensitization to a certain dose and that's lost over time? For some kids that you'll see who have a positive allergy test, they may have sensitization. I kind of alluded to that just before even getting to this, but I have a little one who came to me for egg allergy at six months of age. Over the course of time, she lost her egg allergy, ended up seeing another provider and had blood allergy testing done that was positive to egg. She was routinely consuming egg and had passed the challenge in our, you know, in our clinic and they were told to stop. So that was confusing for the family. Um, I always get asked, why do we have allergy? I wish I had an easy answer for folks, but we'll try to talk a little bit about it, especially as it affects food allergy. Um, but if you think about pre-industrial revolution and even in uh, comparing industrialized countries to third world countries today, um, back in the pre-industrial age, people weren't really talking about hay fever eosinophilic esophagitis or peanut allergy, right? And in most emerging countries today, they're not really complaining through their medical systems about, oh, this horrid EOE epidemic that we're having or this bad asthma. They're talking about infectious diseases and you know parasitic diseases. But what we saw after the industrial revolution is a rise of allergic rhinitis, started immunotherapy as early as 1911. I won't digress into that talk, but then later on rises in pediatric asthma in the 90s, peanut allergy was noted to be increasing in incidence. And then we've had the emergence of relatively new allergic diseases like alpha-1,3 galactose red meat allergy, eosinophilic esophagitis and eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease. So I think this is a, a nice slide, speaks to our audience, right? If you look over here, there's this hygiene hypothesis, a dual allergen exposure hypothesis, and a vitamin D hypothesis that we've tried to relate to the development of either food allergy or tolerance. I'll start over here with allergy. So if you have low vitamin D, if you have broken skin, say with eczema, or, and I'm going to be very particular in calling eczema atopic dermatitis. If you've rotated with me, you know that's one of those little soap boxes I get on, and I'll try to avoid it today. But when for the purposes here, if it says eczema, we're going to call that atopic dermatitis, all right? Um, and you have food exposure through that broken skin. And oh, let's not forget the microbiome, uh, the GI tract. If you have an abnormal microbiome and all this going on, that seems to predispose folks to allergy. It's not the full story, because um, there's certainly genetics and maybe other epigenetic effects. And then if you have a normal vitamin D, you get exposed to foods through the oral and GI tract with a normal microbiome. We seem to think that induces more tolerance. And I'll come back to this later on. Other, another slide on pathogenesis. We don't really know why, and I think you'll get that as we go through this, why certain people develop food allergy, but foods are ingested in huge quantities. Food preparation can certainly impact the allergenic potential um, of certain foods, like roasting peanuts increases the allergenicity versus raw and boiled. Pasteurization may take away some of the benefits that we see of inducing tolerance with regards to milk. Highly glycated foods, so I didn't include it in this, um, in this particular talk, but there is data to show that the rate of rise of allergy corresponds with the rate or increase in um, fast food chains in various countries, especially Australia has good data on that. Medium chain triglycerides. So those that's kind of interesting because what medium chain triglycerides do besides uh, improving nutrition is they also allow translation of food proteins from the gut lumen right to Peyer's patches much more efficiently. So that may be something um, that's an unintended consequence. Formula feeding. 
So if you don't have colostrum and secretory IgA transmission, if you don't you know, establish a good uh, colonic microflora, if you use antibiotics and alter that, H2 blockers and proton pump inhibitor use, not something we think about very often, but the widespread use of those medications may allow more intact protein to transmit to the distal gut. And then delayed introduction of foods, bypassing oral tolerance. This is probably more relevant for me and um, folks who started in pediatrics early on. We used to tell them, you don't introduce these foods until this age, and we don't introduce these foods till this age. That's kind of gone out the window, right? Um, and there's reasons. We'll touch base on that a little bit. So looking at mechanisms, again, people ask me, why do we have allergies? So it's a it's difficult, but here, I don't know why. It, so whatever got blurred out is hay fever. Um, I chose this out of a mechanistic study of allergy, looking particularly at the influence of hygiene hypothesis. The Gabriella study was done in Western Europe and basically compared urban dwellers and those that live on rural farms. The control group for this was those folks who drink only shop milks, so kind of like us, right? I don't know, I assume we all go to the grocery store and buy pasteurized milk. So that's the control group. And those who drink mixed milk, a combination of boiled or unboiled farm milk. And then those who live on farms and drink only uh, unboiled farm milk. And what I want you to see is that this looks at odd ratios for the development. And I picked hay fever here. If you drink shop milk, you're the control group. If you drink any sort of mixed milk, you start to see, and then if you drink unboiled milk, you start to see some decreases in the odds ratios for the development of hay fever. If you boil it though, you're back to the control group level. If you drink only farm milk, look at that decrease. And that holds through for everybody drinking unboiled farm milk. But if you boil it, your risk goes back up to the same or higher than the control group. So that implies that there's something tolerance inducing in that unpasteurized milk. And some research has looked at polyunsaturated omega-3 fatty acids. This has implications for how we feed children today, right? If, there's tolerance, if there are tolerance inducing properties of cow milk, same thing holds true for breastfeeding. And that's one of the reasons that we feel that's very important. But pasteurizing that milk, while a significant benefit from preventing the transmission of infectious disease may impair its ability to induce tolerance. So don't take away from the slide that I'm saying, tell all your patients to go find unpasteurized cow milk. Not what we're saying, all right? Um, GI microflora, I'm not gonna get too uh, lost in this slide. This was a study that tried to determine if supplementing infants that were cow milk allergic with um, lactobacillus could improve tolerance of cow milk allergy. The thing I want you to focus on really is the distribution of, of the microbacterial flora in the gut. And really for cow milk allergic patients, there was a significant difference with the lactobacillus and just the distribution of microbes within the gut. Um, I won't say it was necessarily a successful study and it needs some, um, it needs replication, but really I think the biggest thing for me is that this microbiome does seem to be a factor. And this is just one study looking at that. Prevalence of food allergy perceptions versus reality. So if you look up here, self-report by children and adults of food allergy, 12 to 13%. If you look down here and we just base the diagnosis off symptoms and some sort of allergy testing, you see prevalence drops to 3%. So significantly lower, right? They say they have it. We say we can't prove it, right? And you can see sort of the range of percentages. And then food challenge, interestingly, is about as good as, uh, as a history and testing. Similar reports across the board, except for tree nut allergy, which seems to hold. So reported tree nuts um, and testing seem to be pretty good. The main take home is, is a lot of parent, people experience things that they perceive to be adverse reactions and describe them as allergic, but we can't actually diagnose that at the same rate. So the prevalence of food allergy seems to be higher. And then the perception and inflation of food allergy, I think is probably multifactorial from a self-reporting and the ready availability of testing out there amongst providers as well. 
Um, this is very important within my clinic, but something I want to bring out for you all as well. So if you get confused as to why somebody, you may have sent a patient to an allergist for one particular allergy and they looked at all these other things. Um, if you look at patients, this is from Health Nuts cohort data. If you look at patients who are not food out, don't have food allergy or not sensitized, the rate of tree nut allergy is very low. If they're sensitized but tolerant, you start to see that crop up. If they have egg allergy, you see fairly significant increases in tree nut allergy. They have peanut allergy, not surprisingly. Tree nut allergy seems to go along with that. Even higher if they have peanut and egg sensitization. So multiple food allergic have multiple other food allergens. And then that holds true even for other allergies that aren't peanut or egg. Surprisingly, cashew, and honestly, in clinical practice, it's not that surprising to me. I treat, I test a number of babies every month where the concern is for peanut because that's their first ingestion. They were breastfed. Mom was consuming tree nuts. And the biggest skin test that we have is actually cashew for them. So that's just, and this is just actual data to show some of what we see in clinical practice. So how do we diagnose food allergy? you want to take as detailed a history as you can. There's always an exception, right? So if a baby's exclusively breastfed, really it's what mom's history is, right? Um, but in the case of a non-breastfed baby and a child, you're trying to determine if they have a food allergy, you wanna look at the exact food and try to determine the amount. Sometimes there's a dose response. Was this a reliable recurrence? So it happened the first and second time they tried it and they've since avoided. Was it a one-time thing and they had hives that lasted for days, but they used to eat that food just fine? Timing of the reaction, was it hives, urticaria? Was it a worsening uh, eczematous rash or worsening of their atopic dermatitis? When did it happen? Was it days after they ate it and they said, that's the only new thing we had this week? Or was it relatively immediate? IgE-mediated reactions should happen within seconds to one to two hours. It shouldn't be something that's really delayed. And then physical exam and pictures, verify that with skin or serologic testing. So we always use the history as best we can to guide the testing that we're going to do. Total IgE, I've sometimes had referrals come in with a total IgE. That's why they get sent to me. That's very individual and non-diagnostic. Allergen-specific IgE is fine, especially if it's linked to a history. But if you do broad testing, you may have a lot of positives that you can't interpret very well. And so you need to be wary of that. So this actually happened to me when I left residency, but was interested in um, allergy and immun immunology. And so one of my nurse practitioners at the clinic I was joining, said, like the second or third day I was there, said, hey, can you look at these results for me for this baby with a atopic dermatitis that I ordered a blood test for and tell me what it means. And I said, well, sure. So she showed me the first set. Like, well, it's like, that's all positive, right? And the second set, everything was positive. So this is one of the pitfalls of testing. Now in a four month old breastfed baby, your history is not going to be particularly helpful, but if they have very inflamed skin, when you do broad spectrum testing, you may get a lot of positives that are very nonspecific. Is there something that may be meaningful in here? There is, and we'll talk about how I look at that. But right now, all you know is that this baby has multiple sensitizations, and we're going to have to come up with some approach to decide what to avoid or what not to avoid. All right, so specific IgE testing. You guys can all order this, right? Yeah. Let me see. So everybody out there can order it. It's a great thing. It can help primary care providers figure out if somebody's sensitized or not. You notice I didn't say allergic, right? With a good history in the test, you can define allergy. You know, IgE blood testing has a very high sensitivity to detect IgE, um, but you need clinical reactivity. I'm going to sound like a radiologist here at this point. You need clinical correlation with that result, right? It's also very good at excluding the presence of IgE. One thing I want you guys to look at is the value that your lab test to matters significantly. 
Some places report down to 0.35 KU per liter. That's a measurement of IgE. More commonly, we're seeing assays tighten down to 0.1 KU per liter. This is important because I sometimes have infants that will have anaphylaxis at 0.28 or something like that, 0.2 KU per liter. So by your test, it was negative, right? But they can have reactions. You know what picks up between 0.1 and 0.35? Skin testing. The blood allergy level, if they react, doesn't really matter with, skin, with regards to skin testing. So that's the other point we'll try to address is what's better, blood allergy testing or skin testing, right? That's what everybody kind of wants me to tell them. And I really just kind of say, folks, you have to know what you're doing and how you're using it. Um, if you have a negative skin test and a negative blood allergy test, that's about 100% negative predicted value. But I'll tell you, I always skin test, especially in challenges, to the foods that we're going to test them to. Because you can have false negatives on this type of testing. It's all strata, it's all taken from adult serum. It's not taken from infant sera, and that can have some implications. And some patients react to different 3D structures or isotopes that don't survive that or just haven't been identified and can only be found in the biologic molecule. So the testing tends to be major identifiable allergens. Patients may react individually to less common epitopes. And then age dependent. Infants seem to do things just a little bit differently. So that never trust a neonate or a baby kind of applies in, when we're doing pediatric allergy, okay? RAS testing versus CAP testing. I'm gonna try to blow through this quickly. There's a big point here. We don't do RAS testing anymore. I don't, okay? That's basically where they used to radio label serum, do a little Geiger counter method, assign this class. And it was what we had at the time. It was very inner facility. It varied greatly between different facilities, so it wasn't standardized. And then we've transitioned to immunocap testing, which is a quantitative chemiluminescent assay that allows us to determine how much IgE is actually bound in that sample. The biggest question that I get from parents is how severe is this? Are they gonna have anaphylaxis? Um, you know, they'll ask me, what's the blood test say? Well, you know, one child may have a class one test and have anaphylaxis because their blood allergy level is 0.38. I'm just making numbers up, right? But that gets, when you get the readout, as a class one. Another child may have anaphylaxis at a value of 12, and theirs ends up being a class two or a class three. What I want you to think about with allergy testing if you have a history suggestive of food allergy and you have a positive test, they have food allergy no matter what that value is. The higher it is, the more likely it is that they're more highly sensitized. Skin testing can be a way for you to visually see how they react. But when I talk to parents, I just tell them, look, it's, it's a yes or a no. It's not a gradate, gradation. It's a yes or a no. We're simply using that test to validate that you had a food allergic reaction and you're at, at risk for anaphylaxis. I don't usually like that answer, but that's the one I give them. So my favorite thing to do is torture babies, right? I'm a pediatrician, that's what we do, right? We shouldn't be scared of them. Um, and so skin testing, I think is a great way for us to use as, as a clinical test. It's not a perfect test. Sometimes I have to get blood allergy testing because for whatever reasons, they were on antihistamines that day. Their skin was horrifically inflamed with eczema or atopic dermatitis or um, whatever. And they, so they couldn't stop medicines. The skin was too involved. Maybe they were highly dermatographic or something. And we couldn't interpret the testing that day. But for the vast majority of patients, it's a safe, easy, in the clinic way for us to look at clinical reactivity. And it also gives the parents an idea of what that looks like, you know? They don't understand numbers, but when you blow that child's back up, they're like, ooh, I'm gonna take it seriously now, especially if peanut or something is really just taking over the back. Um, these are wheel and flare reactions. And you can see this little one's wearing a diaper, um, probably under two. So if you ever hear that ad, is it, you can only send them to the allergist when they're under over two, don't believe it, right? 
if you heard me, I'll tell you, if they have skin and they're out of the uterus, we can skin test them. You just have to be very careful with how you interpret these things. Because in all reality, skin testing very, very young infants, they are a little bit dramatographic. Think about every time you pick them up, how hard, you know, red their skin gets in those areas. And they don't make a lot of IgE. So their values and their skin tests, we have to be very discerning of what's positive and what may just be a technique issue. So you have to be careful, but don't not let them see us. All right, the gold standard for food allergy diagnosis is a double blind placebo controlled food challenge. I am not a food allergy center in my clinic. I can't do double blind placebo controlled food challenges. One thing I want you all to remember is that you know, we do a lot of dietary avoidance in our clinic. And if a child has atopic dermatitis and we're removing foods from the diet, much like we do in a double blind placebo controlled challenge, we're breaking the tolerance they have for that food. So they may be eating peanut or egg or milk regularly, but they're seeing me because they have poorly controlled atopic dermatitis. I do skin tests or have blood allergy tests. And it looks like they're highly sensitized. When they're regularly getting those foods, they may not be gaining weight and they have bad skin and they're itching all over the place. When I take that food out of their diet, we're breaking some of that tolerance and putting them at risk for severe food allergy reactions. So when I do that, that's why all these patients get EpiPens and strict instructions to avoid. Once we clear the skin, then we're going to reassess, retest, and try to do what I do, which are open challenges in the clinic to a food that we think is safe to reintroduce. The food-induced, we're going to go through some specific conditions, and I'll try to make sure I'm not getting too far behind. Food-induced anaphylaxis is what you guys think of, right? Little Johnny eats a peanut, breaks out in hives, vomits, and that happened within seconds to a couple of hours, and that happens consistently when he eats peanuts. You guys all see that. That's kind of classic food allergy. I want to focus right here on immediate GI hypersensitivity. I highlighted this, breastfed infants with reflux. I don't have time to dive into it, but most breastfed infants shouldn't reflux significantly and shouldn't have problems gaining weight. So if you have a breastfed baby who refluxes a lot and has atopic dermatitis or bad eczema, I want you to think about food allergy, okay? Um, a lot of times allergy can just be GI. They may vomit, have a little bit of diarrhea that follows that. Interestingly, kids will avoid foods that make their mouth burn or their tummy hurt. But if they're four, they don't know that's abnormal and to tell mom and dad, right? Or if they have autism and they can't communicate why they avoid those foods and their diet is only yellow things or only <laughs> certain colors, you have to think maybe there's something going on. The strangest story I've ever heard was this mom said, yeah, my kid's weird. I'm like, okay, you're the mom, but why is he weird? And he's like, you know, he eats Snickers, but he always spits the peanuts out. And he doesn't like peanut butter. She's like, what kid doesn't like peanut butter? I'm like, well, sometimes ones who aren't alert, who are allergic. So, hey, why do you not like the peanuts? He's like, they make my tummy hurt. And that mom's head snapped around like, you know, what? You never told me that. He's four. He doesn't know that's abnormal, right? So you have to think about that some. Food-dependent exercise-induced anaphylaxis is a rare disorder, but can be associated with anaphylaxis within two hours of a meal. So if they eat wheat is commonly implicated, sometimes celery, sometimes other foods, it'd be really hard to sort out. They will have a reaction to exercise, but if they don't exercise, they can eat the food without any issues. So very rare. Eosinophilic esophagitis, I am not going to spend a ton of time on this. I know that y'all probably talk about this. It's recognized we see patients with eosinophilic esophagitis. And we try to do food allergy testing or environmental allergy testing to help guide treatment recommendations. I think the biggest thing for y'all to recognize is that it presents differently in children in older teens and adults, right? So it can present with feeding aversions, feeding refusals, reflux, failure to thrive in younger children. It can present more with dysphagia and food impaction in teens and adults. Um, I have a subset of my population that have very seasonal EOE symptoms, 
And so once we've excluded foods and we've tried everything else and nothing else is working, if they're highly environmentally sensitized, I put some of those patients on allergy shots. And believe it or not, for that subset, it's actually effective. It's just their esophagus is the target organ, not their lungs, not their nose or the skin. So that's not everybody, but it's certainly a subset. We also now have a new treatment option with dupilumab, which is an injectable medication that we can use to treat this. Um, and then eosinophilic, uh, eosinophilic gastrointestinal disease is an extension of this to the lower GI tract. It can really be kind of difficult. And I really think it's just surveillance and biopsying, um, which is just a change in practice and suggestions if we can't figure anything else out. Food protein-induced enterocolitis syndrome. This is one that terrifies me. I've dealt with it through the years. It is a non-IgE-mediated severe disorder, mainly of infants and toddlers. It is cell-mediated. It is a rapid T-cell infiltration of the gut to food introduced food antigens. I'm not going to say allergens, but food antigens. They can have vomiting and diarrhea within two to four hours after ingestion. They can have severe volume depletion and require... Um, you know, admission to an intensive care unit for uh, resuscitation. Milk, soy, oat, and rice are the predominant triggers, but any food protein can do it. And one kid, if they've got one, can have multiples. Um, infants can also have a chronic form that also contributes to failure to thrive. The biggest thing with this is it's not allergic. It's not IgE mediated. The history is different. It takes longer. And you have to recognize this because any allergy testing that we do so the history, one, we're going to exclude allergy. So I get the history that makes me worry. I do allergy testing, be it skin or blood, and it's negative. Then we're having to tell parents, look, Effie isn't going to help this. You have to strictly avoid. I give them letters because if they present with that child to an emergency room, they're going to get treated like it's you know, an allergic reaction to foods. We actually have to have a letter to prepare them to take that to the emergency room and say, this is what they need. Um, a lot of times it can resolve by three, but we have to do challenges to prove that. So that can be a bit of a, a dicey thing. And then food protein-induced proctocolitis is more of that milk protein-induced enterocolitis, relatively healthy infants with blood flex stools who tolerate dietary dairy introductions, typically by nine to 12 months. Oral allergy syndrome is something I see in my clinic. People who complain of itching with raw almonds, peanuts, peaches, pears, uh, maybe sometimes fruits or vegetables like fresh carrots, um, bananas, melons. You know, I put some of this up. Most of these patients, it's interesting, they come to me because their mouth itches and burns and their tongue tingles when they eat these foods. And that's kind of worrisome, right? I mean, that's not really normal. But they're, when I do their skin test, the trees, grasses, and weeds, they blow up but they don't complain that much about their seasonal allergies. The best thing we can do for them is tell them to eat peeled or cooked fruits. If they have systemic symptoms, we'll give them epinephrine. But a lot of times this responds to immunotherapy. And then some other more rare condition, Heiner syndrome, where kids have recurrent lower respiratory tract symptoms with exposures to milk. They can demonstrate pulmonary infiltrates um, on chest x-ray, can be associated with iron deficiency anemia. I've never seen this, but it's always something I keep in the back of my mind. And then food-induced rhinitis can happen in infants with food allergy because they're actually allergic and they're coughing, they're wheezing, their nose is running. You know, we take that away. That all clears up. I have adults that ask me about it, and I just don't believe in it for adults or teens. Now, there is gustatory rhinitis we'll touch base on. So just again, to break this out looking at immunologic reactions to foods. And these are the examples that we provided, FPIs, milk protein-induced enterocolitis, celiac disease, and Heiner syndrome. Then pharmacologic effects of foods, where we have some foods that cause either high in histamine content, can cause histamine release, or other sort of food, I guess, vasoactive amines and foods, histidines, salicylates, sulfites, and MSG. Typically, those are more for the adults. But the histamine and the histamine releasing foods are something we'll talk about in just a sec. This is just a table to show different sort of non-IgE food intolerance or adverse food reactions. Lactose intolerance, you guys are very used to looking at. If you have lactose intolerance, fructose intolerance is another disaccharide deficiency. I was thinking about sucrose, isomaltose. So if you have people who seem to have lactose 
uh, intolerance type symptoms to multiple foods, there may be other sugars that they're intolerant of. Scombroid fish poisoning is the one that typically involves people going on cruises, eating seafood on a cruise ship, particularly dark meat fish, and then having something that seems like an allergic reaction. And that's mainly where they've ingested some histidine that gets converted to histamine and causes those symptoms. Gustatory rhinitis is the people eat spicy foods and their nose starts to leak and run and feel congested can certainly happen. And then panic disorder was something I dealt with, particularly in the military. I haven't seen it as much outside, but I have one child, um, particular teenager, who has this. Um, but this is people will have reproduce, will just have adverse symptoms, just even smelling a food. Um, so something to keep in mind. Histamine and food reactions. So foods with high histamine content I've listed here, foods that induce histamine release. And I'll focus primarily on citrus fruit, strawberry, pineapple, nuts, peanuts, tomatoes, spinach, and chocolate. For all those kids that are teething, have pacifiers, and have saliva breaking down the area of skin where all that saliva is in contact, these foods will actually cause a nice perioral rash and peridermal perioral dermatitis just from non-IgE mediated histamine release. They're utterly fine. They just get some red rash with those foods. The other thing that we see with these types of foods is kids who have active atopic dermatitis. And the moms are telling you it's the strawberries, it's the tomatoes, it's the citrus fruits and everything that flare the skin. They're not wrong. It does, but it's not necessarily an allergic mechanism. We can help sort that out. But a lot of times, once we get the skin under control, they tolerate those foods just fine. So we're not going to delve too much into atopic dermatitis but you'll see that I can't really separate food allergy and atopic dermatitis in my clinic. And sometimes people get really confused about, does it cause food allergy? Are they associated? I think they're comorbid conditions that you have to realize that we have to manage. And certainly atopic dermatitis can predispose to food sensitizations. So these are just slides showing that in the egg sensitive atopic dermatitis patient and the milk sensitized atopic dermatitis patients, um, excuse me, those with atopic dermatitis who are egg sensitized, those who are milk sensitized and peanut sensitized are higher across the board than those in the control groups. So atopic dermatitis seems to be associated with food sensitization. And this is just another slide to demonstrate that. And it starts early, right? Egg allergy and milk allergy with atopic dermatitis by six months of age. So when I talk to folks, I really want kids who have early onset, moderate, severe atopic dermatitis, especially if they're breastfed, coming our way because their incidence of food allergy, as this slide shows, is very high. So 37% of children overall with atopic dermatitis have food allergy, but that incidence increases inversely with the age of onset. Over 64, over 60% 60 if they have onset less than three months of age. Do you all see that in your clinics? Yeah because they come to me and those are the kids that we want to identify as soon as we can. If they develop atopic dermatitis after 12 months of age, I'll do the full thorough history, but I'm usually less worried about atopic or food sensitization at that age. Um, we'll go through some of this other just for the sake of time. If you look at um, some other cohorts that are out there, cohort data, COFAR, which is here in the U.S., um, has looked at three to 15 month old infants with milk or egg allergy and or eczema atopic dermatitis. If you look here, it took a while for these children to outgrow egg and milk allergy. And by age five, up to 50% still had um, egg and milk allergy versus this population-based cohort where 47% of infants with egg allergy resolved it by two years of life. So with atopic dermatitis, more persistent without, you seem to resolve that sooner. So eczema does clearly seem to be a risk factor. And again, I'm going to say eczema, atopic dermatitis specifically. Food allergy evaluations certainly have a role. Um, milk, egg, peanut, soy, wheat, nuts, and fish are the big allergens that we consider. And some patients, especially if they're older, aeroallergen sensitization may play a bigger role than foods actually do. Um, and really, a lot of times, diagnosis may involve oral challenges, typically once you clear the skin to see if that provokes a return 
of an atopic dermatitis pattern. Um, and that's really when I do these open challenges, we're introducing foods that were safe. We do the challenge to make sure it's safe for the child to consume outside the clinic setting. But we have the parents observe to see, hey, once we reintroduce this food, does their skin flare again? And so that's particular education I have in a secondary part of a challenge. Food allergy management can be very comp it can be complicated from instituting elemental formulas if they're multiple food sensitized, having moms do significant avoidance diets, oral challenges once we clear their skin to try to expand the diet as quickly as we can. Most with atopic dermatitis will outgrow a lot of their food sensitizations by three years, but that's not everybody. And I'll test everywhere from 12 to 18 months. I often use skin testing, especially if I have a positive prior skin test, because once they lose skin test reactivity, I'll move right to challenge. I'm not going to always survey their blood allergy testing. Uh, pasture, this is, we can look at this really quickly. This was another mechanistic study to try to determine um, impact of or the hygiene hypothesis um, as far as you know, the relation of food allergy. And they look basically at early food exposures and dietary diversity, and that seemed to trend towards less atopic dermatitis. So can we prevent food allergy? That would be great, right? Well, we're not very good at that. Um, current evidence right now shows that exclusion diets during pregnancy and lactation are not indicated. Exclusive breastfeeding until four to six months of age is what we're all doing, right? All right, so that should be the universal. Complementary food introduction, even of highly allergenic foods at four to six months of age is what's recommended next because we feel like that four to six months of age is a window where there is oral tolerance induction. So moms eat anything they want while they're pregnant, breastfeed hopefully, and then introduce foods via breast milk without any restriction. And then we follow that at four to six months of age when children are ready and showing those cues with introduction of foods and as high a diversity as we can make it without there being, you know, choking hazards or things. So if they want to blender the, you know, <laughs> if they want to puree any sort of food, I don't really have objections with that. Um, parents do need to be counseled that because we're now going to early introductions, they may have reactions at earlier ages than what they may have thought. So. Um, as we try to put this all together with, you know, look at prevention, here's our baby back. So early food introduction following exclusive breastfeeding, maintenance of the skin barrier integrity and allergen avoidance to include this environmental contact are things that we think may work. So the best hope that we have is moms eat whatever they want during pregnancy. They have a normal vaginal delivery without prenatal exposure to antibiotics and a normal vaginal microflora, the baby has that vaginal delivery, gets to breastfeed with colostrum, establishes that normal gut microbiome and gets all the good tolerogenic uh, benefits of breast milk with food introduction at four to six months of age. And we hope that we can decrease the incidence of food allergy. It's a decrease. We can't prevent it. And we don't know why. So some of these things, this is the LEAP study, and I'm going to go through these quickly just for the sake of time. Um, the LEAP study was early introduction of peanut, basically what they showed and what we would consider not allergic to clearly probably allergic. Regardless, if you avoid in any of these groups, your incidence of progression to peanut allergy by five was much higher than those that were able to consume peanuts. So that's where the recommendations for early introduction of peanuts came from. There was a follow-on study of 1,300 infants um, it, where at three months of age, they were given six highly allergenic foods versus standard practice of introduction at six months. The data they looked at were peanut and egg, and per protocol introductions, they saw that, not surprisingly, peanut had less progression to allergy. Egg did as well. Um, but you can't really prevent this completely. And then <laughs> to just really confuse everybody, right? Because now we think we know our best way to, pre to prevent it. This was from the Australian Health, Health Nuts birth cohort of uh, over 5,000 infants. They looked at skin testing and oral food challenges at 12 months of age to determine food allergy status. 
they had data on 2,000 infants from birth, 30% of them underwent cesarean sex delivery, 13% ultimately diagnosed with food allergy, but they weren't able to determine any uh, effective delivery on food allergy, and there wasn't any modification based on breastfeeding, older siblings, pet dog ownership, or maternal allergy. So this kind of throws everything up there saying there's something other than just probably hygiene hypothesis, broken skin. We still have to think deeper about the development of food allergy. This needs to be replicated. Um, and I've kind of long thought, and if you've ever rotated with me, that there's something about babies that allows them to develop food allergy despite everything that we do. I have to sit in my clinic and make moms cry fairly routinely because we're taking these foods out or diagnosing their kids with food allergy, despite them doing everything. And they'll tell me that, you know, I did everything y'all told me. I did this, we breastfed, we had this, and they still have a food allergic child. And we don't even have dad to blame it on half the time because they're like, none of us has food allergy in our family. So it's been a clinical question. We're just not there yet to know. Commercial early allergen products that are out there, um, you'll hear about these. The caution that I have is these are touted as ways to introduce these foods to babies and develop you know, tolerance and prevent food allergy. They haven't been regulated. The components may be below provoking doses. Parents may have a false sense of security about using these products because we have seen reports where patients, parents were using them and then they feed these children these foods that these packets contain and they have a reaction. So just kind of a word of warning. This slide here is from, again, Australia. It looks at admissions from 98 uh, to 2018. And they were trying to determine, you know, if there were changes based on recommendations, delayed food introductions, not to delay or to give early. And really what they're trying to show through this, and I can let you read through it, is that with the exception of the 15 to 19 age group, they're seeing slowing in the rates of food allergy as we've changed recommendation from delayed food introductions to don't delay to give early, but we'll need to continue to follow that. So food allergy, what do I tell parents? And like I've always done, pick what color poop you want and start with that food first, but moms ought to eat whatever they want when they're you know, pregnant, introduce uh, without restriction via breastfeeding, and then just introduce foods that the family eats in that four to six month window, whenever you feel like it's most appropriately developmentally for that child to start, but there's no real restriction. Management of food allergy. So it's really pretty easy. We have to avoid there. We'll talk briefly about oral immunotherapy. I give everybody action plans. We talk about medic alert bracelets and children should be taught to self-administer when that's appropriate. Typically, I use like 12 years of age for me. And then everybody I diagnose with food allergy without exception, or if I'm worried that foods are causative, gets up injectable epinephrine. Um, we do oral challenges to baked egg and baked milk. You can see how that's done when you rotate with us. Those have been shown to speed the resolution of egg and milk allergy. Um, most patients can tolerate these. There are some that we can't, that can't tolerate it. And if they can eat baked egg or baked milk products in the home, it really makes life easier for the parents and the family. And this data just shows that those with raw egg allergy at age one, if they can tolerate baked egg, were significantly more likely to resolve egg allergy by age two than those that can't. And that's, they can't tolerate baked egg. These are studies that have been published just for peanut, egg, and milk oral immunotherapy. I'm going to talk a little bit about um, a commercially available product, Arrakis Hypogea um, powder. This was rolled out right before the pandemic hit in February of 2020, so they really didn't get this off the ground. Um, this is a daily uh, powder that parents give that contains peanut protein and they have to give it every single day. There's an updosing protocol that starts in the clinic. The biggest issue with this, or the, I guess the biggest goal is to get to this target desensitization dose of three peanuts is what it's FDA approved for, 300 milligrams. There has been through studies demonstrated tolerance up to 26,225 milligrams of peanut protein. That's again, off-label study sites. Um, the problem is it's not a cure. You have to do this daily. 
Anaphylaxis can occur with treatment at home. You can develop EOE with administration. And as studies are showing, even though you can get to high dose tolerance, once you stop it, 100% of the treated patients lose their maximal dose tolerance. Now they don't necessarily go to zero, but nobody's followed them out so long to see when do they get to zero, when do they get resensitized. So these don't induce tolerance, they desensitize transiently, they work, but you have to decide is that the right treatment for your patients. Um, epicutaneous therapy is where I'm really interested to follow this. This is another study, this was two, uh, in 2020, and basically what they looked at is an epicutaneous patch with peanut. Okay, the thing that I think is really important here is that after this was done, so all the patients or 51% of the patients reached this thousand milligram challenge. So they were able to tolerate a thousand milligrams of peanut. And then 18 underwent this sustained unresponsiveness assessment, 14 of those who were still tolerant at month 38. So that to me is very encouraging. But just like I showed you on that little baby, if we can treat through the skin and desensitize through the skin, this may be a mechanism that works better for us. We're just gonna have to wait and see till we have more real world evidence with these treatments. And then dupilumab, so this is a pediatric lecture, but this is an adult study that just came out, starts to, there seems to be some evidence that use of dupilumab for an extended period of time can decrease IgE levels to foods. And so maybe a treatment modifying effect it's encouraging, especially if we start infants are younger and younger, maybe we'll see some uh, impact on food allergy. So natural history, this is what everybody wants to know. The other thing is, is when does this go away? These numbers are all over the place. And if you guys have really been looking, you'll see every time I throw up a food allergy resolution slide, the number is different. That's because the definitions are different. The patient inclusions are different. The study outcomes are all different. So when parents ask me or I talk to folks, I say, look, by age six, about 50% of kids are going to outgrow their food allergies, 80% by age 12. If we're still having a talk at age 12, then they're probably not going to outgrow that. And if it's peanut, tree nut, or shellfish, we're probably not very going to be very lucky with that either. So um, just keep that in mind. It's real hard to look at somebody and tell them exactly when. In our clinics, we're going to... Um, follow them fairly stringently. And then finally, just some slides on using anaf recognizing anaphylaxis, treating it with epinephrine, and then babies, vomiting and behavioral changes may be things that you need to look at. Epinephrine is also your friend. I want you to look at this real quick. Typical resolution in 15 to 30 minutes, onset of cetirizine and diphenhydramine, about 30 minutes. So when we're treating allergic reactions only with antihistamines, we may be treating ourselves more than treating the patients. So if they have food allergy, we need to make sure that they have epinephrine available and that they're ready to use it as quickly as possible, especially if there's mental status changes. And then finally, I don't use diphenhydramine in my clinic at all. I only use cetirizine to treat allergic reactions. The onset of action is just as fast. The efficacy may be better because it lasts longer from a symptom treatment standpoint, they're also not sedated, right? So if somebody has a food allergy reaction and they get Benadryl and EMS shows up and they're out of it, is it because of the reaction or the medication? So just keep that in mind. And then here are some things for referral. They should be in the slide. I think I'm on time. Don't know if we have time for questions, but all right. Well, thank you all very much. I appreciate it.